if you tilt your head just so, if you squint your eyes and lean slightly forward or back or to the left or to the right, and if you stand on one foot while doing all of this, then it's possible to soften the edge of our scripture lesson from Mark's gospel so that it has little to say to us or little to do with us. Certainly it isn't meant to change us. If you make the gospel only about personal salvation rather than also about changing the way the world works in this present life, if you make Christianity only about belief in Jesus rather than trusting or following or emulating Jesus, then the passage doesn't speak to us or challenge us much at all. It only speaks to or challenges this one man who came to Jesus. Let me illustrate. I once heard a sermon where the preacher said, this passage isn't about wealth per se. There's nothing wrong with wealth in general. That's just this man's particular problem because his wealth is what interferes in his personal relationship with Jesus. You see, that makes the passage about the one now 2,000 year old man, but not about me. It domesticates the message by particularizing it. And that's why, if we squint our eyes, it goes away. But the fault in that sermon, and there's always a fault in every sermon, is this. Jesus doubles back, and he doubles down not just once, but twice. How hard it will be for those who have wealth, generally, to enter the kingdom of God. And again, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And again, the preacher set to work to take the sting out of Jesus' words. Cyril of Alexandria wrote that a Greek word was mistranslated, that instead of kamelos or camel, the word should be kamelos, meaning rope or cable. Passing a rope through a needle's eye would be just as difficult, perhaps, but not to the point of being unimaginable. And another dodge states that the Eye of the needle was a small gate in the wall of Jerusalem that opened after the main gate closed for the night. It was far smaller than the main gate, so the story goes. And to get through it, a traveler would have to remove all of the baggage from the camel, and then the camel would have to enter the gate on its knees as if penitent. So it was very hard, even laborious, but it could be done. A camel could could pass through the eye of the needle. Such a gate has to date not been discovered or documented. But what about this? What if we don't tilt our heads or squint or lean forward or backward or left or right? What if we don't stand on one foot, turn the camel into a cable or the needle's eye into a gate or otherwise make this passage difficult but not impossibly hard? Suppose it means what it means. That it is genuinely not possible for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. That becomes a hard sermon to preach. I'm going to try. And I invite you to hear the passage with me in this way. First, a reminder, however. When Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he isn't speaking of a place where our souls go when we die. So lay aside the all good people go to heaven and all bad people go to hell understanding that so many of us grew up with. When Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he is speaking of a kingdom that is in our midst. 
here and attainable, but at great cost. A kingdom that stands in contrast to all earthly kingdoms, God's kingdom, where all the standards by which we measure value and success and achievement and importance go away. And where justice reigns and where all are welcome and no one is excluded. And again, it's not an otherworldly kingdom. It's what God intends for now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus teaches us to pray for and to live into being. And it's a big but. We cannot grasp it if we're grasping anything else. I want to speak for a moment about a monkey trap. Supposedly, there is a uniquely simple and ingenious way that people trap monkeys. They cut a small hole in a gourd. And they hollow the gourd out. And they chain it to a tree. And then they place a treat inside the gourd, a banana or a handful of rice or a handful of nuts. It doesn't matter as long as it's desirable and it's a handful and it can be grasped. And the monkey, so the story goes, reaches inside the gourd, which it can do with its open hand, takes hold of the treat that is inside and then cannot draw its closed fist back out through the small hole. Now the monkey is chained to the tree, not through any physical restraint, but only because so long as it stubbornly holds on to the treat, it cannot escape. All it must do to be free is to let go, but it doesn't want to. How hard it is for a monkey with a treat to escape the monkey trap. Now, full disclosure, not having trapped any monkeys, I do not know if this method works in actual practice, but it works great as a sermon metaphor. An understanding that you have to let go of some things, like a banana or a worldview or a behavior, in order to take hold of other things, actually far more valuable things like freedom or like the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying, you cannot value or exclusively pursue or hold above all things wealth, while also understanding or entering or taking hold of God's kingdom. And to understand that, we need to understand what wealth is. In a word, wealth in this world represents freedom, Independence, security, it's a means of pleasure. If you have enough wealth, the sky is the limit. Heck, even the sky is not the limit. You can fly to outer space. But more even than that, wealth is power. It's a means of determining who the alpha is in the room. It's a sign of accomplishment or achievement. It's a measuring stick by which we can literally determine what people are worth. In the kingdom of the world, a king is worth more than a peasant. A college graduate is worth more than a high school dropout. A CEO is worth more than an assembly line worker. That's how the world's wisdom works. And not only is it that way, it also should be that way in the wisdom of the world. And the more wealth you have, the more wealth and power you can get, so an unimaginably wealthy person is worth more than a merely incredibly wealthy person. If you have enough wealth, you can have nearly anything in this world but the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven has an entirely different currency. Not wealth, not power, 
love. And not love as simple affection or a general feeling of be nice to everybody you meet. In the words of Dr. Cornell West, justice is what love looks like in public. You don't have justice, you don't have peace, you don't have love, you don't have the kingdom. You don't have it and you can't have it. You can't have a little of one and a little of the other. Remember in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus teaches, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. He had to let everything he valued go to take hold of what was truly valuable. That's hard. But remember the way out of the monkey trap. The way to freedom, the way to the kingdom of heaven begins when we begin to open our hand. Wealth, power, and privilege are good things. But look at what's possible when you begin to give them away. When the wealthy give wealth away, the hungry eat. When the privileged give power away, the downtrodden rise. When the haves give money away, the have-nots have some. When the educated give education away, the less educated prosper. Think of Dolly Parton's book club, which has helped reduce high school dropout rates in her native Sevier County, Tennessee, from 44% to 6%. Freedom is not entitlement. Freedom is letting go of entitlement. And when we begin to open our clenched fist, someone is set free, and if the concept of the monkey trap is to be believed, that someone who is set free is us. You cannot have your wealth with all it represents and have the kingdom too. That's a hard teaching and a high price to pay and a big ask, especially perhaps for those of us who live in one of the wealthiest, most powerful, most privileged countries of the world. It's nearly enough to have us walk away grieving like the man in our scripture lesson. We're addicted to wealth and what it can accomplish We structure our economy so the wealthy can have more wealth. There's a different vision for the world. It's nonsensical and freeing. You have to let go of our trust in wealth and profit and gain and accumulation. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength, and I might add the poverty of God is worth more than human riches. What does the kingdom of heaven that we're supposed to be looking for and working for look like? Our second scripture lesson, the book of Acts, gives us a foretaste. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would, see if this sounds familiar, sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous, glad and generous, glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved in the monkey trap. 
I'll conclude by saying that I saw this congregation breathe just a bit of the kingdom into being yesterday. I saw a church fellowship hall that was filled with furniture and foodstuffs and an excess of worldly possessions, much of it the leftover goods from our own attics and basements and garages. I saw that storehouse emptied. It was all loaded on trucks and in minivans, and it was driven away and given away to a refugee family that had need of it. With glad and generous hearts, I saw members assembling dismantled couches and carrying chairs and tables and lamps and bedding and preparing and delivering food, and not a word of complaint was to be heard. And at the end of the day, no one among us was hungry, at the end of the day, a young family that began the day marginalized and in a hotel in a new country, a place to call home. And note this, not one person walked away sad yesterday. And that's not in any way to pat ourselves on the back and say, job well done, us. To remind ourselves, this is the way the kingdom comes. But only when we let go. Only when we offer what we have. Only when we let God. Mortals, not possible, not perfectly, for God, all things are possible. Yesterday, for a day at least, we escaped the monkey trap and rediscovered the kingdom way where our plenty is in service of another's need. We are, in fact, blessed. It is only so that we may be a blessing. Amen.